Good morning, everybody. Aloha. This is Mark Schlav. I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And uh, in Hawaii, we have lots of attorneys, lots of good attorneys, lots of uh, attorneys with experience all over the world. And we can draw on that experience to help Hawaii, help our community, help our state in progressing. And uh, today, we're going to be talking with a lawyer who spent a lot of time in China, especially in Shanghai. And the title of this program today is called Shanghai. And that's, that's my uh, attempt at humor, I guess. But uh, today, our guest is Sarah Coase. Sarah, welcome. Thank welcome. you for having me. So, well, thank you for being here. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, you, right now you're the vice president legal counsel for uh, Central Pacific Bank. Uh, you're not here on behalf of the bank today. You're, you're just here to share your experiences and background uh, in China. Yes. Uh, but uh, your present p position is uh, probably uh, different from what you've had in the past, and I want to learn a little bit about that. Um, before coming to Hawaii, I understand you, you lived in Shanghai for 11 years. You worked for a law firm and some uh, maybe large, large co companies, and I hope you'll tell us a little bit about that. Um, myself, from my, my own experience, uh, uh, my uh, father was born in China. He was born in Harbin, oh, wow. China. And so I've always been, been drawn to China. I've always wanted to learn about China and go to China. And I went to China about 10 years ago, a little more than that. I uh, went to sh Shanghai. Uh, it's one of the most interesting historic uh, cities in the world, in my opinion. I uh, really, really enjoyed the experience and meeting the people. But I'd like to learn about yours and, and how you got there and, and how you developed your practice or how you became a lawyer there, where you worked. Uh, first, though, let, let's talk a little bit about your background. Where, where, were, you, where were you born where did, and where did you go to school and grew up? So I'm from upstate New York. I spent my entire childhood there, um, north of Albany, near Schenectady, Saratoga region. Um, so I grew up there. <laughs> and and uh, what type of... Uh, environment what, so it's was, it was, you suburban know, Co Coles, C -O -E -S. that's not a Chinese name you no know, it's you know. not um, my my parents are both their families are from Massachusetts um, there's actually a Coe's Square in Worcester if you okay. I think there may be a highway where it used to be there's at least a Coe's Pond there but anyway yeah my father worked for General Electric for 40 something years and General Electric since Schenectady New York okay. um, so it's a suburban rural type community Okay, so very right. non-diverse, um, very different than other things, but it's also a great place to visit and grow up. So. Okay, and law school or college, where did you, college so, and law school, where did you go? So college, I went to Columbia, which is in New York City, and at that point in time in the early 90s, people from upstate New York did not go to New York City. So many people tried to talk me out of it. It was considered very dangerous. It's pre-Giuliani. New York City. Okay. Um, but I had a great time at Columbia, and I decided to stay and also went to law school there. Okay, okay, now, I'm just curious. People yeah. tried to talk you out of going to uh, downtown New York. Yes. Why, what made you say, no, I'm going to go there? Um, I guess I had a... a rebellious. Did, a little bit rebellious, a little bit, you know, you know I, the music I listened to, the kind of things I was into, I thought that, you know, New York City was a place where I was going to be exposed to a lot more types of people, culture, you know, concerts, clubs, fun. Okay. Yeah. All right. And is that what you, you found to be the case? Uh? I did. Um, I eventually had to focus on studying, but I had a little bit too much fun my first year of college, and then after that, I got into the books. Okay. All right. Now, um, at some point in time, you developed an interest in China. Yeah. And, and, and were, were your parents involved in China or any background there, like my father? or N Not at all. So basically in high school and then in college, I always studied German. Um, I went on an exchange program to Germany in high school. And then in college, I actually went to Germany one summer and worked as a waitress. Um, I had a desire to learn a second 
I guess, a third language, a second, second language. And so I was just thinking about what to learn, and I had narrowed it down to Korean or Chinese. Um, I chose Chinese based on liking to watch Zhang Yimou movies. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Never thought I'd go there. It was just, you know, I, you're paying a lot of money to go to college. You're allowed to take up to something, 20-something credits a semester. And I had the view I should get my money's worth, so I took the maximum number of credits and took extra things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Why were you watching those Chinese movies? I really liked movies. I had a good friend um, in college, and still my good friend. We used to go to movies at least once a week. It was just something we did. Okay, but not the typical uh, movies, perhaps, or, or maybe that in that yeah. time it was. I'm not well, sure. Well, no, in New York City, there's a lot of more of what you consider art house type I cinema. See. So there's a a lot to choose from, and so we often went to that type of movie. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to press you a little bit. What? <laughs> About, what about China? I mean, you, you, you saw the movies and you, you, had to, you wanted to learn a new language, so there's something there. There's something there that touched you. I'm not sure it touched me. It fascinated me because you listen to them talk, and I, at that point in time, I couldn't make out anything. You know, Normally, if you listen to someone speak you know, Spanish or French, you can make out some words. It might sound similar to English. It was just completely foreign to me and interested me because of that. It was a challenge. Okay. All right. So you, this was in college. Yes. And what was your, your next step in your progression towards China? How, how did you, you decided to learn the language, and then you decided what? What next? Yeah. What? So I took two years of Chinese, um, my junior and senior year of college, and then I applied to law school. I got into law school, and I was suddenly faced with I need to grow up now. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to have a job. You know, that this is my life. And I wasn't ready for that yet. So I was able to defer a year to go to law school. And so I requested to defer. And then I decided I wanted to go to either China or Taiwan for the year because um, I felt like it would help me understand the new culture, improve my language ability, just have a kind of a broad type experience before getting on with my life. Um, so I was. I decided this may be my May of my senior year. I was too late for any of the programs that send you to teach somewhere. This was before China was really on the internet. So I actually wrote, you know, actually typewritten letters and researched at a library addresses of universities in China and sent them out. And somebody called me up maybe a month later with a job. From China? From China. Wow. Wow. And, and where was that? And where? Um, so it's in um, Shanxi province. That's the province where Xi'an is. It's a city called Hanzhong. So if you're a China scholar, that was important in the Three Kingdoms period. Not really okay. since. Okay. Um, but it's a, they call it a prefecture. So it's kind of like a county with about 300,000 people, which is small for China. Right. Um, very rural, very poor. And there was a teacher's college there. And I taught English to people who are going to be future high school English teachers. Okay, and what was the name of the school? Um, you could call it Hanzhong Teachers College, or sometimes they call it Hanzhong Zhong Normal College. Normal in Chinese, when they translate to English, teachers are, I don't know, for some reason, teachers' colleges sometimes are called normal university okay. or college. Okay. okay, I've heard that before. Yeah. Too. So, all right, so you, you uh, took two years? Just uh, one year. Uh, no, I'm sorry, two, two, two years of Chinese oh, yes. in college. <laughs> And you're staring at going to law school. Yes. And, and what, well, what, what, why law school, too? I mean, what? what uh... So that wasn't very well thought out on my part. I love being a lawyer, but at that point in time, um, most everyone I went to college with ended up becoming an investment banker, a consultant, you know, Anderson Consulting, or going into the dot com. I looked into those careers. I wasn't that interested, so the backup was law school. Okay, so that's uh, I've never heard of backup of law school, but okay, <laughs> that's, that's a, a lot. A lot yeah, yeah, okay. I, it just it seemed like the best option, and I, you know, it always kind of appealed to me. I had a great aunt who was a lawyer in Boston, a criminal defense attorney, probably graduated from law school in the '30s, so one of very few women, and it, you know, it always seemed kind of. I don't know, exciting and glamorous to me that she was a lawyer and had done that. Okay, and and so you got uh, you you just wrote kind of uh, yes. without knowing yes. what would happen, and somebody said sure. Mm -hmm.
come and you went and well what how did that transpire what 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 was the experience you had in the, in that time you mean my time in china yeah 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 so it was very very difficult for about the first 6 months in china um you know it was a it was very poor it was a lot of culture shock and i also got to china and i didn't understand a word anyone was saying and when i tried to speak to people no one understood a word i was saying it was just completely different than what i had learned in chinese class and you know it was also challenging that you know during the winter there we would only have electricity and water a few hours a day because there was a reservoir and only so much water had to last the winter so it's just huge changes and also i was very isolated because i was one of two foreigners in the town of 300,000 people the other foreigner was much older than me a man i didn't get on that well with him so i was just very much alone everywhere i went people stared at me there weren't that many foreigners in china then you know they followed me around they took photos of me it was it was not hard you you were <laughs> like uh, a, a brand new uh, exhibit that's right somewhere uh, yes and <laughs> and so so what happened um eventually i became good friends with you know some cuz i was young i was what probably 22 i was there were students who were even older than me and i became friends with people you know i started finding people who chinese chinese people who you know my chinese also at one point just suddenly clicked like i started being able to communicate with people quite freely and i found people who wanted to you know spend time and be friends with me without any ulterior motive there were a lot of people who wanted to be friends with me to impress their friend or this or that and maybe learn to speak english practice yeah. english yes um so finally you know i found found people that i got on with and i also got quite used to being alone and it no longer bothered me okay and so well the interesting thing is the friendship thing yeah. and and uh learning to make friends with foreigners uh, foreigners f for us and they're you're their foreigner i guess yeah. is kind of something important uh that we should be doing and, and in in that respect did, was it hard in china i mean did you uh find that um these fr friendships were hard to develop or or d did it take a little bit of time it sounds like it took a little bit of time and then somehow there was something that that worked some some relationships that somehow worked yeah i think i mean i don't think it's that as much this way probably anymore in china but then you know I've, the foreigners were very much the other then and so and then there's also this probably a view of americans as very rich and so what everyone's focusing on are the differences but i think over time you know people would see what's the same and sometimes doing things like you know working hard or helping out on something like like you're everyone's equal you know the people saw it, finally saw that I am just like them that I'm no different you know I'm but you know they have to get past their preconceptions I guess and something you said you know to me really touches me and that is that you find things in common yeah and all of a sudden when you find things in common even if you don't look alike and you don't speak the same language somehow you're able to come together and that sounds like to me what what happened yeah what happened okay uh, i want to talk a little bit more about taking off from there and going into you becoming a lawyer and your continued contacts with china but we're going to take a short break okay. right now okay <laughs> welcome to thinktechhawaii.com this is Johnson Choi, your host. The topic is Asia in Review. We do it on a monthly basis on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Be sure to check the schedule. See you. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation Coming Soon. 
You can catch us live on thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. All right, we're back with Law Across the Sea with Sarah Coles, who's talking with us about her life in China. And uh, she worked for 11 years in Shanghai and now works for a bank here, Central Pacific Bank, uh, in Hawaii, although she's not here on behalf of the bank today. But uh, we'd like to, I'd like to lead up and find how she finally got here. So let's talk a little bit about that, Sarah. So. You went to college. Uh, after college, you before you went to law school, you think, I, I, I'm not ready for law school, so <laughs> let's spend some time in China. And I, I still think there's something there that drew you to China. Uh, it, maybe, maybe it was the movies, but I also <laughs> think there's something more, some in my mind, because you, you developed friendships and you learned the language. What happened after your, your stay as a teacher in, in China. What happened with your career going forward? So I went back to law school. Um, and then at law school, I was, I guess, pleasantly surprised because there are a lot of um, major US and international law firms at the time setting up offices in China. And there was a lot of work for foreign lawyers in China as far as developing major infrastructure projects. And so while in law school, I sought out internships for you know, summer clerkships at law firms that had that sort of business in the thought that in the future, that's something I would be interested in doing. It would be an exciting thing to do as a lawyer. And in, in China, you, you kind of put the two together. Then. Yes. I mean, so maybe that year, <laughs> maybe that year was meant to be, yeah. uh, that, that year t teaching. Yes. It worked out for Yes, because I wouldn't have gone that direction otherwise if I hadn't spent the year okay. first in China. Okay, so then, then what, what happened next with, with your career once you went through law school? and? Yeah, so I actually decided to start my career in New York City after doing two summer clerkships in Asia. What I found is it may have changed, but at the time the offices in Asia were quite small and there wasn't as much of a training program for a young lawyer. And it was my goal to be a great lawyer who could work anywhere in the world. I didn't want to be just a China lawyer. So I decided to first work in New York City and get a few years training, um, but work at a law firm where I would have the opportunity to transfer to a China office. And so I worked for a British law firm, well, it's not truly British anymore, it's a European law firm, you could say, called Freshfields Brookhouse Daringer. Um, I worked first at the New York office, and then later I moved to their Shanghai office after about not sure, about two, two, three years. In, in Freshfields, when you applied for the job there, was your China background something that they looked for or did they care about it? Or just you being a, a, a graduate of, of Columbia, it's probably a good, yeah. good thing too. Well, I had applied first actually for their Asia offices. So they had a, what you call China practice, which covered Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing. And I'd done a summer clerkship there. And they had given me an offer to go out to any of those offices after I graduated. Typically, the new graduates at that time would go to Hong Kong, get training for a few years, and then transfer to either Beijing or Shanghai. And I specifically requested them, could I instead start in New York? And they accommodated me. OK, and why was that? Just curious, I can't help but. Why did I want to be in right, New York? Right, right, right. I just really felt that I was going to be getting the, the training I needed okay. in New York. All right, that makes sense. Okay, so then what happened? So I was in New York. Um, in the interim, I got married, which we haven't touched on, but um, my husband is Chinese. I had met him when I was teaching English in China. Oh, okay. Um, so he had come to New York. We were married, um, and my mother-in-law got became ill, and I was now a Chinese daughter-in-law. And as a Chinese daughter-in-law, if you're family needs you, you go. So we arranged to, for me to go to the Shanghai office so we could be closer to my husband's family. Okay. Well, where was he from? He's from Xi'an. Okay. So yeah. he's from Xi'an. And so there is a romantic part of this story. That, that we haven't it, touched yet. That we haven't yet. touched yet. Uh, uh, okay. Well, let, so then, then what happened? Then, then what happened with respect to your career? And maybe we'll... So in... So when I had been in New York, I'd actually been doing mostly finance work, um, project finance, structured finance. When I got out to Shanghai, the work was more M&A related. Um, 
I was put on, having never done an M&A deal in charge of a $500 billion M&A deal. Um, I learned a lot. I worked wow. very hard. The hours were much longer than New York hours. The New York hours are very long. Um, but I, I had a great time. And I did, you know, I, I succeeded in closing that deal and many other deals and became a great M&A lawyer. But then um, I had a child in the interim. She was about a year old. I never saw her. I worked both days on the weekend. And a friend called up, a friend from law school who was working in Beijing at the time, and told me that he had a friend working at Honeywell who was looking for an in-house counsel. Would I be interested? And I did some research, because if you're going to go in-house, you want to go to the right place. You don't want to be jumping around. It seemed like a great place to work. And so I decided to apply for the job. I and got that, it. And that was in Shanghai. That was in Shanghai. Honeywell's Asia Pacific headquarters are in Shanghai, so it covers, depending on the business, different numbers of countries, but uh, one, up to 17 countries are being serviced mainly out of Shanghai. And how long were you there? And At Honeywell, I was there about eight years. And, and then, then what, <laughs> what happened? Then um, I kind of, I guess based on, by then I had three kids. Um, I felt that I needed to leave China for their education, for their upbringing, for clean air. Um, and we, we kind of thought long and hard about what do we want to do. You know, there were great job opportunities for me all over, but we decided that we were going to decide based on what was best for our family. And we decided we wanted to live in Hawaii. So I took the Hawaii bar and looked for a job. Wait, so had you ever been to Hawaii before? Yes. Yeah, so my husband and I had been after we got married. Um, so it was my first time, I guess, the honeymoon. Okay. And then while in China, to avoid becoming a Chinese tax resident, which would mean they'd want to tax my income globally, you leave China for 31 days every five years. And both times we did those 31 days in Hawaii, we rented a house in Waimanalo. Okay. And so I guess we all had this really great memory of, you know, so Hawaii Hang actually uh, came into play here as something that would attract you uh, because of your honeymoon. And rom <laughs> this is a romantic story that I you know, didn't know was part of this, yeah. this whole professional career also. So it, would that be a true? Uh, I don't know if a romantic, <laughs> but it's definitely a very good place for a mixed family to live, um, a culture you know, that your kids fit right in. And it's very international. My kids go to public school here, but there's, there's students who are, you know, a lot of Japanese students, but there's also Polish, Australian. There's, it's very international. And the kids like it. And the kids like it. They're very happy. Okay, and I've got to ask, too, you know, you, you have three children. Yes. So obviously, you're not subject to the, the Chinese law. Yes. Uh, one child, or whatever it is now, but at that time, it was one child, mm -hmm. right? And were, were you... Uh, absolved from that rule because of the, the foreign, because you were yeah. a foreigner? Or? So the law in China is enforced based on the woman. And so if you have a Chinese passport as a woman, when you want to give birth, you need some sort of permission. But I'm not a Chinese okay. woman. All right, so you were free. Okay, now, uh, uh, while you worked in China, did you have to pass any special law, uh, tests or laws that uh, would allow you to work uh, in China? No. Um, so I was never a Chinese lawyer. I was always maintained, at that time I was just a New York lawyer and maintained my New York bar certification. Um, you could look more that when you're in China as a foreign lawyer, you're more of a legal consultant, you might say. Um, but often the contracts you're working on, you know, they're not under Chinese law. So I would never give a Chinese legal opinion. And you usually try for your clients to negotiate, if you can, under a US law or perhaps Hong Kong or Singapore law. Um, depending on what the contract is. How, does com how do you compare working in China to working in the United States? What are the pluses and minuses, and wh what type of uh, work atmosphere did, did, did you have, and what type of uh, business-type relationships? What, what, what was it like? How do you compare it? I don't know how, but how you compare it. It's not that different. I would say in China, both places I worked were very team-oriented. People were very friendly. You became very close to the people you worked with. Um, you know, it was very positive. And then here, also, people, I think it's kind of an influence of the same thing that, you know, you, people are also very friendly and team oriented. And, 
you know, maybe in China it's a little bit more. Like if someone in your office in China gets married, the entire office is invited. And here in the U.S., you can't afford to do that. Here, here, so here in Hawaii, but uh, would you feel the same about New York? Uh, I would say New York probably a little bit less friendly, perhaps. You know, when I went on business trips in China, we often it was a group of us traveling. People would always wait at the end of the jet bridge to walk together and meet together for breakfast, and it was very... Nobody was left out. It was very coordinated that you were doing everything together as a group. And in the U.S., when I've traveled as a group, you know, we haven't interacted the same way. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but you know, in China, it's a very communal type society. The way you do things. It's a cultural thing. Yeah. Yeah, from China. Now, I want to ask you. Uh, you, you. I think there was a hand that moved you into the China direction and back to Hawaii also somehow, uh, circumstances maybe, but what, what has your experience in China done for you? What, what has it meant to you in your personal life, your profession, and ju ju just how you feel about yourself? What, what, is that, what, what has China experience done for you? Okay, this is a difficult question. Um, I think it's given me a more global outlook. Perhaps it lets me more easily understand other people's point of view. Um, I think as a communicator, even though Chinese culturally are very indirect in the way they communicate, living there has made me more of a direct communicator because I didn't want something to get lost in translation no matter what language I was speaking. So I tried to learn how to communicate in a way that people were certain what I meant because I can't be as subtle when I'm speaking a second language. Okay, all right, and, and so you do, and you speak Chinese, you speak Mandarin, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so l let me ask you to say something for us. Uh, l let's pretend that I am a uh, Chinese lawyer. Okay. And what would you tell me about Hawaii, and I'm gonna, I'll ask you to translate it too. What, what would you tell me about your experience in Hawaii uh, to, a, to a Chinese, to, to uh, tell them about your life here? In, in Mandarin. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. 住在夏威夷很舒服,这儿的空气非常好,然后工作在这儿还可以,这儿的其他的律师是非常有知识,非常友好,也工作的事情有意思。Okay, and what did that mean for me? I'm now back <laughs> to being an American okay. lawyer. Okay, um, so I said it's very, it's, it's great to live in Hawaii. Um, the, you know, it's beautiful and the air is very fresh and clean. That's important to Chinese who live in pollution. And I said to work here as a lawyer is also very good. Um, the people are very friendly um, and the quality of work is very interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Xie Xie, that's, huh. that's as much as I can go in Chinese. <laughs> xie Xie, thank you very much. Thank you.